Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is Sir Buzz, as told by Flora Annie Steele. The story comes from Steele's book, Tales of the Punjab, Told by the People, first published in 1894. This is an old-fashioned fairy tale with magic, adventure, and, of course, romance. It also happens to include a vampire. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Once upon a time, a soldier died, leaving a widow and one son. They were dreadfully poor, and at last matters became so bad that they had nothing left in the house to eat. Mother, said the son, give me four shillings, and I will go seek my fortune in the wide world. Alas, answered the mother, and where am I, who haven't a farthing wherewith to buy bread, to find four shillings? There's that old coat of my father's, returned the lad. Look in the pocket. Perchance there's something there. So she looked, and behold, there were six shillings hidden away at the very bottom of the pocket. More than I bargained for, quoth the lad, laughing. See, mother, these two shillings are for you, and you can live on that till I return. The rest will pay my way until I find my fortune. So. He set off to find his fortune, and on the way he saw a tigress licking her paw and moaning mournfully. He was just about to run away from the terrible creature when she called to him faintly, saying, Good lad, if you will take out this thorn for me, I shall be forever grateful. Not I, answered the lad. Why, if I begin to pull it out and it pains you, you will kill me with the pad of your paw. No, no, cried the tigress. I will turn my face to this tree, and when the pain comes, I will pat it. To this the soldier's son agreed, so he pulled out the thorn, and when the pain came, the tigress gave the tree such a blow that the trunk split all to pieces. Then she turned toward the soldier's son and said gratefully, Take this box as a reward, my son, but do not open it until you have traveled nine miles. So the soldier's son thanked the tigress and set off with the box to find his fortune. Now, when he had gone five miles, he felt certain that the box weighed more than it had at first, and at every step he took it seemed to grow heavier and heavier. He tried to struggle on, though it was all he could do to carry the box, until he had gone about eight miles and a quarter, when his patience gave way. I believe that tigress was a witch and is playing off her tricks upon me he cried. But I will stand this nonsense no longer. Lie there, you wretched old box. Heaven knows what is in you, and I don't care. So saying, he flung the box down on the ground. It burst open with the shock, and out stepped a little old man. He was only one span high, but his beard was a span and a quarter long, and trailed upon the ground. The little mannequin immediately began to stamp about and scold the lad roundly for letting the box down so violently. Upon my word, quoth the soldier's son, scarcely able to restrain a smile at the ridiculous little figure. But you are weighty for your size, old gentleman. And what may your name be? Sir Buzz, snapped the one-span mannequin, still stamping about in a great rage. Upon my word, quoth the soldier's son once more. If you are all the box contained, I'm glad I didn't trouble to carry it further. That's not polite, snarled the mannequin. Perhaps if you had carried it the full nine miles, you might have found something better. But that's neither here nor there. I'm good enough for you at any rate, and will serve you faithfully according to my mistress's orders. Serve me? Then I wish to goodness you'd serve me with some dinner, for I am mighty hungry. Here are four shillings to pay for it. No sooner had the soldier's son said this and given the money than with a whiz, boom, bing, like a big bee, Sir Buzz flew through the air to a confectioner's shop in the nearest town. 
There he stood, the one-span mannequin, with the span and a quarter beard trailing on the ground, just by the big preserving pan, and cried in ever so loud a voice, Ho, ho, sir confectioner, bring me sweets. The confectioner looked round to the shop and out of the door and down the street, but could see no one, for tiny Sir Buzz was quite hidden by the preserving pan. Then the mannequin called out louder still, Ho, ho, sir confectioner! Bring me sweets! And when the confectioner looked in vain for his customer, Sir Buzz grew angry and ran and pinched him on the legs and kicked him on the foot, saying, Impudent knave! Do you mean to say you can't see me? Why, I was standing by the preserving pan all the time. The confectioner apologized humbly and hurried away to bring out his best sweets for his irritable little customer. Then Sir Buzz chose about a hundred weight of them and said, Quick! Tie them up in something and give them into my hand. I'll carry them home. They will be a good weight, sir, smiled the confectioner. What business is that of yours, I should like to know, snapped Sir Buzz. Just do as you're told and here is your money. So saying, he jingled the four shillings in his pocket. As you please, sir, replied the man cheerfully, as he tied up the sweets into a huge bundle and placed it on the little mannequin's outstretched hand, fully expecting him to sink under the weight, when, lo, with a boom, bing, he whizzed off with the money still in his pocket. He alighted at a corn chandler's shop and, standing behind a basket of flour, called out at the top of his voice, Ho, ho, Sir Chandler, bring me flour. And when the corn chandler looked round the shop and out of the window and down the street without seeing anybody, the one-span mannequin, with his beard trailing on the ground, cried again louder than before, Ho, ho, Sir Chandler, bring me flour. Then, on receiving no answer, he flew into a violent rage and ran and bit the unfortunate corn chandler on the leg, pinched him, and kicked him, saying, Impudent varlet! Don't pretend you couldn't see me. Why, I was standing close beside you behind that basket. So the corn chandler apologized humbly for his mistake and asked Sir Buzz how much flour he wanted. Two hundred weight, replied the mannequin. Two hundred weight, neither more nor less. Tie it up in a bundle, and I'll take it with me. Your honor has a cart or a beast of burden with you, doubtless, said the chandler. For two hundred weight is a heavy load. What's that to you? shrieked Sir Buzz, stamping his foot. Isn't it enough if I pay for it? And then he jingled the money in his pocket again. So, the corn chandler tied up the flower in a bundle and placed it in the mannequin's outstretched hand, fully expecting it would crush him, when, with a whiz, Sir Buzz flew off, with the shilling still in his pocket. Boom! Bing! Boom! The soldier's son was just wondering what had become of his one-span servant, when, with a whirr, the little fellow alighted beside him, and, wiping his face with his handkerchief, as if he were dreadfully hot and tired, said thoughtfully, "'Now, I do hope I've brought enough, but you men have such terrible appetites.' "'More than enough, I should say,' laughed the lad, looking at the huge bundles." Then Sir Buzz cooked the griddle cakes, and the soldier's son ate three of them and a handful of sweets, but the one-span mannequin gobbled up all the rest, saying at each mouthful, You men have such terrible appetites, terrible appetites. After that, the soldier's son and his servant, Sir Buzz, traveled ever so far, until they came to the king's city. Now, the king had a daughter called Princess Blossom, who was so lovely and tender and slim and fair that she only weighed five flowers. Every morning she was weighed in golden scales, and the scale always turned when the fifth flower was put in, neither less nor more. Now, it so happened that the soldier's son by chance caught a glimpse of the lovely, tender, slim, and fair Princess Blossom, and of course he fell desperately in love with her. He would neither sleep nor eat his dinner, and did nothing all day long but say to his faithful mannequin, Oh, dearest Sir Buzz, oh, kind Sir Buzz, carry me to the Princess Blossom, that I may see and speak to her. Carry you? 
snapped the little fellow scornfully. That's a likely story. Why, you're ten times as big as I am. You should carry me. Nevertheless, when the soldier's son begged and prayed, growing pale and pining away with thinking of the princess Blossom, Sir Buzz, who had a kind heart, was moved and bade the lad sit on his hand. Then, with a tremendous boom, bing, boom, they whizzed away and were in the palace in a second. Being nighttime, the princess was asleep. Nevertheless, the booming wakened her, and she was quite frightened to see a handsome young man kneeling beside her. She began, of course, to scream, but stopped at once when the soldier's son, with the greatest politeness and in the most elegant of language, begged her not to be alarmed. And after that, they talked together about everything delightful, while Sir Buzz stood at the door and did sentry but he stood a brick up on end first, so that he might not seem to pry upon the young people. Now, when the dawn was just breaking, the soldier's son and Princess Blossom, wearied of talking, fell asleep, whereupon Sir Buzz, being a faithful servant, said to himself, Now what's to be done? If my master remains here asleep, someone will discover him, and he will be killed as sure as my name is Buzz. But if I wake him, tend one who will refuse to go. So, without more ado, he put his hand under the bed and, bing, boom, carried it into a large garden outside the town. There he set it down in the shade of the biggest tree and, pulling up the next biggest one by the roots, threw it over his shoulder and marched up and down, keeping guard. Before long, the whole town was in a commotion because the Princess Blossom had been carried off and all the world and his wife turned out to look for her. By and by, the one-eyed chief constable came to the garden gate. "'What do you want here?' cried valiant Sir Buzz, making passes at him with the tree. The chief constable, with his one eye, could see nothing save the branches, but he replied sturdily, "'I want the Princess Blossom!' "'I'll blossom you! Get out of my garden, will you?' shrieked the one-span mannequin, with his one-and-quarter-span beard trailing on the ground. And with that, he belabored the constable's pony so hard with the tree that it bolted away, nearly throwing its rider. The poor man went straight to the king, saying, "'Your Majesty, I am convinced your Majesty's daughter, the Princess Blossom, is in your Majesty's garden just outside the town, as there is a tree there which fights terribly.' Upon this, the king summoned all his horses and men, and, going to the garden, tried to get in. But Sir Buzz, behind the tree, rooted them all, for half were killed, and the rest ran away. The noise of the battle, however, awoke the young couple, and, as they were now convinced they could no longer exist apart, they determined to fly together. So, when the fight was over, the soldier's son, the princess Blossom, and Sir Buzz set out to see the world. Now, the soldier's son was so enchanted with his good luck in winning the princess that he said to Sir Buzz, My fortune is made already, so I shan't want you any more, and you can go back to your mistress. Pooh, said Sir Buzz. Young people always think so. However, have it your own way. Only take this hair out of my beard, and if you should get into trouble, just burn it in the fire. I'll come to your aid. So Sir Buzz boomed off, and the soldier's son and the princess Blossom lived and traveled together very happily, until at last they lost their way in a forest, and wandered about for some time without any food. When they were nearly starving, a Brahmin found them, and, hearing their story, said, Alas, you poor children! Come home with me, and I will give you something to eat. Now, had he said, I will eat you. It would have been much nearer the mark, for he was no Brahmin, but a dreadful vampire who loved to devour handsome young men and slender girls. But, knowing nothing of all this, the couple went home with him quite cheerfully. He was most polite, and when they arrived at his house, he said, Please, get ready whatever you want to eat, for I have no cook. Here are my keys. Open all the cupboards, save the one with the golden key. Meanwhile, I will go and gather firewood. 
Then the Princess Blossom began to prepare the food, while the soldier's son opened all the cupboards. In them he saw lovely jewels and dresses and cups and platters, such bags of gold and silver, that his curiosity got the better of his discretion, and, regardless of the Brahmin's warning, he said, I will see what wonderful thing is hidden in the cupboard with the golden key. So he opened it, and lo, it was full of human skulls, picked quite clean and beautifully polished. At this dreadful sight, the soldier's son flew back to the Princess Blossom and said, We are lost! We are lost! This is no Brahmin, but a horrid vampire! At that moment, they heard him at the door, and the princess, who was very brave and kept her wits about her, had barely time to thrust the magic hair into the fire before the vampire, with sharp teeth and fierce eyes, appeared. But... At the selfsame moment, a boom, boom, binging noise was heard in the air, coming nearer and nearer. Whereupon the vampire, who knew very well who his enemy was, changed into a heavy rain pouring down in torrents, hoping thus to drown Sir Buzz, but he changed into the storm wind beating back the rain. Then the vampire changed to a dove, but Sir Buzz, pursuing it as a hawk, pressed it so hard that it had barely time to change into a rose and drop into King Indra's lap as he sat in his celestial court, listening to the singing of some dancing girls. Then Sir Buzz, quick as thought, changed into an old musician, and, standing beside the bard who was thrumming the guitar, said, "'Brother, you are tired. Let me play.' and he played so wonderfully and sang with such piercing sweetness that King Indra said, What shall I give you as a reward? Name what you please, and it shall be yours. Then Sir Buzz said, I only ask the rose that is in your majesty's lap. I had rather you asked more, or less, replied King Indra. It is but a rose, yet it fell from heaven. Nevertheless, it is yours. So saying, he threw the rose towards the musician, and lo, the petals fell in a shower on the ground. Sir Buzz went down on his knees and instantly gathered them up, but one petal escaping changed into a mouse, whereupon Sir Buzz, with the speed of lightning, turned into a cat, which caught and gobbled up the mouse. Now, all this time the Princess Blossom and the soldier's son, shivering and shaking, were awaiting the issue of the combat in the vampire's hut, when suddenly, with a bing, boom, Sir Buzz arrived victorious, shook his head, and said, You two had better go home, for you're not fit to take care of yourselves. Then he gathered together all the jewels and gold in one hand, placed the princess and the soldier's son on the other, and whizzed away home, where the poor mother, who all this time had been living on the two shillings, was delighted to see them. Then, with a louder boom, bing, boom, than usual, Sir Buzz, without even waiting for thanks, whizzed out of sight, and was never seen or heard of again. But the soldier's son and the princess Blossom lived happily ever after. The best sentence in this story is, of course, I am convinced your majesty's daughter, the Princess Blossom, is in your majesty's garden just outside the town, as there is a tree there which fights terribly. I like this story. I like that Sir Buzz is so boisterous and obnoxious. And I actually like our hero, the soldier's son. I like that he doesn't take advantage of having a powerful servant. He doesn't bully others. I like that he falls so much in love that he sends Sir Buzz away. His life is so complete that he can't imagine anything else that he needs. It's cute. And of course, this story feels like weaving together a lot of story elements we've seen before. You know, the rescue of a tigress with a thorn in her paw. Uh, the genie in a bottle kind of thing. You have an all-powerful servant and the bit about how you can open all the doors in my house, but that one. I was trying to remember which story it was where the bad guy turned themselves into one thing after another, and the good guy turned themselves into one thing after another, and one of them becomes a rose that falls from heaven. It was the trade that no one knows. It was a Danish folktale. 
But of course, this one also has some surprises, including the surprise appearance of an Indian vampire and the complete surprise cameo from King Indra in heaven. Did you know that in ancient Vedic texts, Indra was the king of the gods and the lord of heaven, but he diminished over time. He became just like another powerful hero, demigod, and eventually in Indian Buddhism, sometimes even something of a buffoon. But, of course, what interests me most here is the vampire lore of India. Some form of vampire legend exists in the ancient folklore of just about every culture on Earth, which is why some people actually believe in vampires. In traditional Indian folklore, there are several different monsters who have some of the characteristics of a European vampire, and we can't really know what the word was that steel is here translating into vampire, but I suspect that the original monster was a pichacha, and I may not be pronouncing that correctly. Pishachas appear in both Hindu and Buddhist mythology. They are evil demons with bulging veins and red eyes. They prefer the darkness and they hang out in the cremation grounds, eating flesh and drinking blood. They can also become invisible, shapeshift, and possess human beings. Interestingly, they're also heavily historically associated with the Punjab and the Kashmir region where Steele collected these particular stories. Ancient texts describe tribes of Nagas and Pishachas inhabiting the Kashmir Valley. Weirdly, and I don't really understand this part very well at all, they also seem to have had their own language. Um, Paishachi, again, probably not pronouncing it correctly, but it's a literary language that dis- that is described in ancient Sanskrit grammars, and it's either mentioned as a dead language or a language of the dead. The terminology is ambiguous. It was a literary language, and that means that it was a formal or an academic language. It was not used in casual, everyday speech or writing, and it may have been used as a religious language by some schools of Buddhism. There aren't any real examples of this language, though, only references to it and references to books that were written in this language. And of course, the idea of a formal language of vampire demons is so much more interesting than just a lost Kashmiri dialect, but uh, that's way down the path of speculation. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that autumn is my absolute favorite time of year. I get all excited when the air starts to turn cool and I think it might be time to start wearing sweaters again. It's been long enough that I get excited about coats and scarves and cocoa and soup and fuzzy socks. I try to hold on to just enjoying this piece of it for as long as possible without looking too far ahead. That way I can maximize my enjoyment of each one of the holidays, one after the other from Halloween to New Year's without getting burnt out too early. I get annoyed that there's already Christmas stuff in the stores. Why do we have to just rush over and ignore all the distinct pleasures of autumn just to stuff ourselves on the pleasures of Christmas? When I do that, I'm sick of Christmas before it even gets to December, and I don't want anything to do with it anymore, and I like Christmas but I'm also easily bored. So the reality of it is that it's actually not cold. It is still balmy and sunny, but the air is a little bit crisp and the leaves are turning and I am wearing sweaters, even if they, you know, make me sweat. (laughs) If you are also easily bored, you should subscribe to this channel. Every week I find a new, strange, obscure story from somewhere in the world and I share it with you. Please also drop me a like or a comment down below, or maybe even share this video with a friend to help spread the word. Thank you so much for all your support, and I will see you in a few days.